Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Global Science Summit on COVID-19. I'm Arnold Donald, President and CEO of Carnival Corporation, and I'll be co-hosting the summit today along with Gloria Guevara, President and CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Gloria. Hello and thank you, Arnold. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from around the world. I would like to welcome everyone to our virtual uh, summit. It's an honor for me to join this group uh, from London. We have around 17,000 people registered to participate with us from all around the world. Arnold? You know, our, our objective today is to learn as much as we can about COVID-19 from leading medical and science-based experts. Uh, through this summit, uh, we hope to cut through the noise, which is bombarding us every day on COVID-19, and provide to everyone a baseline grounded in science and the latest facts. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has completely disrupted our world as we knew it, far beyond what probably any of us could have imagined. Yet the reality remains that we need to learn to live with this virus in such a way where the interim precautions and their unintended consequences are not worse than the virus itself. And as always, the best way forward in any difficult situation is to have a thorough understanding of the facts available at the time in order to make the most informed decisions possible. So our goal today is for these sessions to better inform us all on those facts. Gloria. That is right, Anul. Travel and tourism sector and the 330 million people around the world whose livelihoods depend on us have been tremendously affected by COVID, unfortunately. One of the great joys of being a citizen of the 21st century has been our ability to discover the world, to experience other countries, other cultures, and to learn from each other. And we are all anxious to go back to normal. But we all know that it will be a new normal in the short term. The better we can understand this virus and how best we can minimize the risk for our sector, the workforce, the travelers, and local communities, very important. That's why we have assembled this group of experts to help us to just do that. We have been very clear with all of our panelists that there is no one single point of view we are asking them to endorse, nor one particular solution we're asking them to support. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. You know, so let's get started. Now, we have three sessions today. The first will help us understand what this virus is, is epidemiology, uh, the ways in which it is spread, and the science of detection and testing. The second session will focus on the science of prevention, treatment, and ultimately cure. And then our final session will address moving forward with life in a COVID-19 world. Each session will be about an hour long and will hopefully address many of the questions that have been submitted in advance from all of you. So we also will do our best to incorporate questions submitted live during the conference. Now between each panel session, we'll have a short break to reset our panelists. So if you get disconnected at any time, you can easily just use the same link to log back in to access the live feed. Now for context, the biographies of our panelists are in the upper right corner of your screen. Gloria. Thank you, um, Arnold. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our first distinguished panel. We have a group of experts. First, we have Dr. Stephen Gordon, Chairman of the Department of Infectious Disease from the Cleveland Clinic Respiratory Institute and Professor of Medicine, the Learning College of Medicine at Case Western University. Welcome, Dr. Gordon. Then we have Dr. William Morris, Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and President of the Mayo Medical Laboratories. Welcome, Dr. Morris. And finally, we have two uh, experts from St. Jude Research Hospital, Dr. Stacy Schultz-Cherry with the Department of Infectious Diseases at St. Jude. As a faculty member of her laboratory in part of the Center for Excellence in Influenza and Research and Surveillance, and also, uh, this center is part of the World Health Organization collaboration, which is great. And we also have Dr. Joshua Wolf. Dr. Wolf is a pediatric infectious disease um, physician at St. Jude, where he is the medical director of antimicrobial stewardship and the program lead 
for um, gematology and oncology infectious diseases. So each one will be directed at a particular panelist. Each question will be directed to a particular panelist. But all of you, if you have an important perspective to share, please feel free to jump in. Okay, thanks again for being with us today. Let's just start with Dr. Gordon. Dr. Gordon, welcome. Uh, can you please tell us about epidemiology of COVID and how does this infect people? Basically, what are the symptoms? Can you share, please, your views? Well, yeah, thank you, Gloria, and, and thank you, Donald. So it's a pleasure to be here. I still want to start with just a note of gratitude to all those essential workers in healthcare and not, as, as well as all the people that have suffered from COVID uh, that we have seen. In terms of your question, I also just want to level set. Um, as was mentioned, we are in what we call the pre-protective phase of COVID, meaning uh, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have antivirals, and we don't have what we call herd immunity. So as you both correctly stated, we are learning now to live with COVID until that happens. And hopefully that will happen with a vaccine. In terms of this infectious disease, um, as an infectious disease clinician, if I was Michael Crichton and writing a novel, I couldn't pick a better uh, scenario. You have truly a novel pathogen, meaning it's new. It's a zoonosis, originally from bats, did jump to the humans, no pre-existing uh, immunity, which obviously uh, leads to a lot of spread. It can spread readily from person to person, as we have seen. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with all our international travels and things, uh, it can quickly go across the world. So in contrast to the other novel coronaviruses that have we seen this century, such as a severe acute respiratory syndrome, COVID-1, uh, COVID or Middle Eastern respiratory uh, syndrome virus, this has spread quickly across the globe and, as we said, a pandemic. As a clinician, you mentioned the typical presentations. Um, this has taught me, uh, you don't approach this virus with hubris. Uh, that is to state, initially, the sick patients coming into Asia had a respiratory type illness, similar to what we would say a severe acute pneumonia, cough, fever, and what we'd say infiltrates on chest X-ray. These are the sickest presentations. But as we now know, there's a myriad of presentations associated with COVID-19, ranging from, as we now know, acute loss of taste and smell, skin findings, and even more subtle findings uh, including fatigue, um, as well as a sense of muscle aches. I see. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. So, Let me ask you a question. You, you mentioned, go ahead, Arna. Yeah, go yeah so I was as, just as gonna say, at, can you just start from the beginning of, of the, you know, when is it onset? How does it manifest? Why does it manifest within a family differently, uh, et cetera? Go ahead. Yeah, so great questions. Um, for most for most people, this will not re require hospitalization, um, and that is classified as mild illness. Doesn't mean that the illness is mild for those of us that have had influenza, and so you can have inapparent infections. However, for that 20% that requires medical care, a small percentage will require intensive care, and obviously morbidity can happen. Uh, this can lead to a cascade of inflammation, uh, often involves the lungs, it's been described as a quote unquote inflammatory syndrome, but the autopsy data that we have today still suggests it's primarily the lungs that take the hit directly from the virus, although other sequelae. So I think um, for most people, this is still gonna be uh, a relatively mild, as we would say, viral illness, but the, the danger of course, is we know that it could cascade into serious illness. Arl mentioned the uh, issue about households. I do wanna raise that as an important issue. Um, there is household transmission. That is prime, the primary way how this virus keeps going in our communities. And if you have a household member with COVID, your chances of getting COVID would be 15 times higher than those without a household member with COVID. And if we think about it, these are the people that we're sharing our most airspace with, usually without masks. Now, on the other hand, this isn't measles, where almost everyone in the household that, that would be non-immune would get it. Most household transmission is usually at about 20%. That is one in every five household members. That's good. So, doctor, let me ask you a question. Uh, as you say, this virus, at least what we know right now that we didn't know before, is the asymptomatic. What is the current estimate of asymptomatic spread? And also, can you comment uh, on when uh, are the people most more infectious? When is that, that time frame that people get more uh, the virus spread? Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, it's a great question and an important one. So when we think about an infectious disease, we think about when will you be potentially transmissible to others? 
Things like influenza, usually a day before you can transmit. In SARS-1, usually it was after the onset of symptoms. In, in COVID-19 and generally, we know that probably two days before the recognition of symptoms, you can transmit. And that informs us about two things. One, for contact tracing, but also the mask policy, the face covering, that non-pharmacologic intervention uh, that we're pushing out into the public. The other thing about COVID-19 is, of course, your highest viral loads, the most contagious, is at the onset of the illness. And that falls with or without treatment in all patients. And that translates into less infectivity with time. And in fact, in most household or contact tracing, there's very little spread after day five of illness in the households or in the hospitals. So you say is that the first five days are the crucial ones. That's what you're, uh, if I can summarize what you say, that is that what you're saying? The first five days are the most important for COVID. Is that right? What I understood? And, and potentially the two days before symptoms, uh, which, which obviously is a little bit more difficult to protect against uh, without that universal cloth covering. Okay. Doctor, you, you also, I would like to also know, because there are some uh, reports out there that say sometimes people have been infected and they're, they're, the reports say that you can be infected again. Is that the case? Can you comment on that? Can you get the virus once you had it? It's a very good question, and, and there's a lot of reports of quote-unquote reinfection. To date, in the medical literature, there has not been a definitive case showing reinfection of those who have recovered from COVID-19. When we look, however, we do know that people can test positive for the RT-PCR weeks and even months after. And so most of these reports are what we would say persistent positive RT-PCR testing that probably represents lingering what we would say viral shedding, not replicate virus and not reinfection. If we look at other human beta co coronaviruses, generally speaking, reinfections are not certainly going to happen within the first 90 days. Although, Dr. Gordon, if I might interrupt, in our uh, research at St. Jude, where we've been doing both adult and pediatric cohort studies looking at infection with coronavirus, We've already seen at least one case of documented resolution of symptoms. So a patient whose symptoms completely went away and who had negative PCR testing on two occasions for the virus, who then developed new symptoms that were not related to the original symptoms and then again tested positive. So I think although we don't know how frequently it'll occur, um, second infections or recrudescence of uh, a primary infection is definitely possible because I've seen it. Uh, what what other, uh, the, others of what you others like to have comment to on that? I would just say from the testing side, which we'll get to, that it is a real, a real challenge for the, 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 really what both of the panelists have mentioned. We know that there can be persistent positivity for the PCR test, a molecular test for the virus after symptoms have resolved and that it appears to be non-infective. Yet we know that there are also um, you know, scenarios such as described where patients become asymptomatic, have a negative test, and then come back, have a positive test. The reality is we're, you know, we're still a few hundred days, 200 days into this illness, and there's so much to learn. So we're, we're taking very small pieces of information and trying to extrapolate across the whole globe. So there's still a lot to learn. Right, and, and scientifically... Let's go back to epidemiology. To, to, I, I I'm sorry, say, Gloria. Let's we'll go back to epidemiology. Yes, yes I have to sorry, have one was, question well, related to the epidemiology, if, if you don't mind, which has to do with the blood type. I'm sure that you have seen the reports. I'm based in Europe, and here there were a lot of reports about having uh, blood type O, um, positive or negative. You have less chances of, of getting the virus. Can you comment on that, Um Please, Dr. Gordon or anyone else. I, um, <laughs> I, I've seen those reports. You know, to date, I have not seen definitive biologic predisposition. People are looking, this is looking at what we call mega data in terms of here. Um, but I, if I was blood type O and I'm not, I would not take that uh, to mean how, that, I, uh, that I would be immune or, or I would not drop my, my prevention precautions. So as was mentioned, I think we're still early on. There's a lot of associations uh, being made um, in, in terms of here. Um, and I think we'll just have to wait and see. We do know, however, there are social determinants for this. That is to say, in the United States, in the world, 
for instance, if you're a person of color in the United States, you're three times more likely to acquire COVID and also more likely to be hospitalized and die. And that probably is not biologic. That is what we call some of the other social determinants of health, which COVID-19 is really also, I think, uncovered in the United States and elsewhere. I would just say, too, from the diagnostic testing. Oh, just from the diagnostic testing side, I think it's really confusing for people uh, because they hear about things like the blood group and the association with different disease courses with different blood groups. We don't do diagnostic testing for that because that does not translate into actionable uh, information for a physician treating a COVID patient. They can't, as was mentioned by Dr. Gordon, it's not that they can use that information to say, oh, I'm going to manage this COVID patient differently. So they're interesting associations, but they're not necessarily actionable. And that's why, you know, we don't test the blood group of every patient that tests positive for COVID. Okay, I so let's, I see we let's have move on. A, a lot of questions. Part. Do we want to move to the? Yeah, go ahead, Arnold. We have a lot of questions yeah, for thank them. You, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. Gloria's in London, and I'm in Los Angeles, so we have a little bit of a delay um, on the technology <laughs> here, and so we'll, we'll work it out. So uh, uh, first of all, Dr. Shulcheri and Dr. Wolf, who've already been introduced, uh, we want to turn to you now. Um, welcome to the panel. Uh, we very much uh, appreciate you being here with us today. Um, I guess the first question is very basic. So this is all around transmission. So what are the various ways that the virus is transmitted? So what are the ways it's transmitted? And then could you explain how it spreads from one person to another? Um, and let's talk about things like heart surfaces and HVAC systems and outdoor versus indoor, et cetera. So please, Dr. Um, Shosheri, please. Josh, do you want me to, do you want me to start with some? Do you, do, you do you want me to start with some of the virology and then I'll turn it over to you, Josh, for, okay. Um, so there are several hypothesized ways that the virus can spread. Um, it, that would include respiratory droplets, um, aerosol droplets, fomites, and fecal oral transmission. So if we break those down a little bit, respiratory droplets are these large particles that come out when you sneeze, cough, talk, sing. Um, and we know that those droplets contain infectious virus and you have to be in close contact with somebody in order to get infected. And we know that is one way that it can be transmitted. But also in that exhale breath, in the sneeze, are smaller, much, much smaller droplets that are considered more aerosol droplets. Um, and these are one that, that we've heard more recently on the news that the virus can get into the air and remain in the air for many hours. And quite honestly, there's really no good evidence yet that the virus is spread by these aerosol droplets. And most of the studies that have, have um, pulled SARS out of the air, if you will, have been based on molecular diagnostic tests, which don't tell you about infectious virus. The next route would be fomites. And that's when these respiratory droplets get onto surfaces. And you can then get it from your cell phone, the door handle. This is where hand hygiene becomes very important. And there's a very nice study that just came out where they actually took infectious SARS virus and put it into a substrate like a mucus that you would have being secreted by a person put it on hard surfaces and asked, how long does that virus actually remain infectious? And what they found, which I think is great news for everybody, is that it was anywhere from 10 to 24 hours on these hard surfaces, but it was very much dependent on temperature and humidity as is transmission. So lower the temperature, lower the humidity, the more stable that virus is. The last route, because um, we won't talk about animal to human transmission because that's not important in the current um, pandemic. But the last route is fecal oral. And we've heard also a lot about this in people having stool samples test positive for weeks and weeks and weeks by molecular diagnostic tests. And again, there's no good evidence that that virus in your stool is actually infectious. So have said that, you need to take all of this with sort of a grain of salt, because science is constantly moving and changing. And like you heard, we're only 200 days out 
of a completely brand new virus that we're trying to compare to how flu would behave or how SARS-1 would behave. So it's like going on a trip. And the first time you go on a trip, you're sort of hesitant. You don't know your way around. But as you keep going and going to the same place, different places, you get more and more confident. And that's what we have to do in research. We have to keep asking the question over and over with new tools, better questions. And that's why you will often see CDC, WHO, Dr. Fauci sort of modify what they have said in the past because now we have new information. And I'll turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Dr. Wolf. Thanks, Dr. Schultz, Terry. So I, I think what I'll talk a little more about is what's the evidence of each of these routes of transmission. And I think just clarifying the distinction between what's called droplet spread and aerosol spread is I think really important, especially if you're thinking about uh, modifying environments or modifying exposures to prevent transmission. And so droplet spread, as Dr. Schultz Cherry said, is the larger droplets that we emit, especially when we're talking, singing or coughing. And they tend to drop to the ground pretty quickly once they're outside our body. Um, they don't float around in the air like um, like pollen or, uh, or or like the you know the smell of cooking, and they they drop to the ground quickly. And so you have to be relatively close to someone uh, to to uh, acquire the virus from them. The droplet itself um, lands on your face or in your eye or on your mucous membranes and uh, or your hands, and then you rub it into one of your mucous membranes. When we talk about mucous membranes, we mean eyes, nose, and mouth which we think are probably um, the vast majority of way of acquiring this virus. And so droplets, relatively easy to prevent by distancing, masking, uh, and, um, and trying to avoid long exposure. The bigger issue of aerosols, which is those floating particles, they're much smaller, they're able to float on air currents like the smell of cooking or like pollen, and you know how hard it is to keep those things out. The, um, the the evidence that uh, SARS-CoV-2 might survive in aerosols is actually pretty good. Um, the, the virus can be aerosolized in the lab, and once it's been aerosolized, even for several hours, um, the, they've shown that you can grow live virus, which means that the virus could be infective. Um, the, um, the, We've shown that people produce these aerosols that contain virus. So if people have sucked the air out of hospital rooms with patients who, are, who have SARS-CoV-2, and uh, they, they uh, show that there is virus in it, although nobody has yet, as Dr. Schultz-Cherry said, been able to grow virus from that. But that's partly a technical problem rather than a, a clinical problem. And then there's two cases um, in the literature where the suggestion of aerosol transmission has occurred. One is a group of people in a choir who were singing their hearts out for over two hours, uh, and uh, one person managed to infect 60 people in a relatively large radius. That case, although um, compelling, isn't isn't perfect because there are a lot of people milling around and there was a lot of movement. And so it's possible that that shorter range transmission did occur. And then there's a case in China of a, uh, a, a individual who's sitting at a restaurant uh, and managed to infect people on either side much further than two meters, uh, which is usually the longest that a droplet will go. But even in that case, there was some mitigating factors, and, and that was specifically a, a relatively high velocity airflow from an air conditioner that was pushing air back and forth uh, in both directions. And so I think, again, not perfect evidence. And then there's some evidence against airborne transmission. So um, in most cases with, with exposure have been in close contact. When we've been able to show transmission, it's usually people who've been within that two meters and usually unmasked. And then, um, then I think the best um, evidence is, is uh, as I think Dr. Gordon said earlier, this virus doesn't transmit as well as the viruses that we know are uh, well transmitted by airborne, by the airborne route or the aerosol route, and that's measles and chickenpox. And so if you're in a room with someone with chickenpox, you get chickenpox. If you're in a room with someone who has measles, you get measles. And this hasn't happened. And so I, I think probably where we are is we can comfortably say that the predominant route of transmission is these droplets that uh, you get by being within two meters of someone, usually with them not wearing a mask. Uh, 
But it's not as clear as that. And, and I think it's unlikely to be dichotomous. It's more likely that it can spread as aerosolized under certain circumstances. And that has a big impact on how we prevent the virus because um, air handling, air conditioners, um, indoors versus outdoors, UV uh, disinfection, all of those things are related to does it spread just by droplets or also by aerosol. So let's talk a little bit more about how it spreads. So there's two aspects you both reference, you know, duration of time, you know, how, how long you're exposed to it, how much you're exposed to, and, and then the distance uh, between people. And then, you know, we, we've seen a lot of literature now that suggests transmission from hard surfaces is limited, as is transmission through HVAC systems, which you've touched on. So if you could talk about duration of time, um, distance, quantity, and then speak specifically to what the evidence suggests on transmission from hard surface and HVAC, I think um, the audience would appreciate it. Go ahead. So perhaps if I take the time and distance thing and then Dr. Schultz, Chair, if you'd like to take the, the surfaces. Mm -hmm. So time, at, in, in, uh, time of exposure has two effects. One is random effect, which is that the longer you're, it, it, when you walk into a room with someone, if you're going to get exposed to the virus, it doesn't necessarily happen immediately. So the longer you're there, it's like um, if um, if someone's, I don't know if you guys have probably never tried this, but if you take a, 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 a bucket of popcorn and try and throw it in someone's mouth, it takes you a few tries to get it. And so the, the randomness element, the number of, of minutes that you're being potentially exposed is a really important contributor. And there's, when you think about that, there's obviously no cutoff. There's no point at which you can say, well, that's been long enough or that hasn't been long enough because it's the randomness element. And that's really important for both droplet spread and for aerosol spread. The other element is the actual viral load or the amount of viral particles in the air, which is much more important for aerosol spread, that um, airborne spread where the virus gets into the air. And we really don't have a good, not, a, a good idea of how important that is. But in situations where viruses are airborne spread, time is incredibly important because the amount of virus in the air builds up. And the other issue is whether someone is masked or not, or has a, has a facial covering. Because although um, uh, although um, masks are imperfect, they markedly reduce the amount of virus that you're uh, able to expel into the air, either in droplets or in micro droplets um, as aerosols. And so um, I always say that um, if I'm in a room with a patient who has COVID and there's only one mask, I want them to be wearing it. Ideally, I don't want to be in that situation, but I, I, I think I want them to be wearing it because that reduces the risk of them shedding into the air and, and me um, inspiring it. And so I think that's super important. And then um, I'll talk very briefly about AC. Um, AC has two major issues from a COVID standpoint. One is that it blows air around. And so um, air movement in some ways is good because if you can exchange the air in a room uh, quite rapidly, then that might reduce the amount of virus. And that um, depends a bit on what kind of HVAC you're talking about. If you're talking about an HVAC that brings in fresh air or that filters in a way that's reliable for eliminating the virus, then that may be helpful. If you're talking about an HVAC that just recirculates air without filtering out virus, then that probably makes things worse because it moves particles away from the person. Um, and then the other issue is of, um, of air movement, so just blowing air um, either way. And that may have a, a really important role. So it, it, it may just act like a fan that, that increases the distance that a droplet can spread before it, um, uh, before it infects someone. And so having talked about those, I'm gonna talk, um, hand over to Dr. Schultz Cherry to talk a little bit about survival and infectiousness on surfaces. Right. Well, and I, I want to make a point about the HVAC, too, is there's a lot of very nice data with other respiratory viruses and bacteria, some of which we know do get into these, these aerosol droplets, that a proper HVAC system with good filtering will actually remove some of those um, pathogens from the air. And I think that's really important, is if you're in a closed poorly ventilated um, situation with somebody with COVID, you're much more likely to be exposed than if you're in a well-ventilated system. 
Now, in terms of those hard surfaces, as I said, you know, there was quite a bit of data in the beginning that SARS could get onto these hard surfaces and last for days or weeks. Um, but again, that was not infectious virus. And it, it looks like the virus is not very stable on those surfaces, which makes perfect sense. You know, people in, in the cruise industry are very well acquainted with norovirus. And norovirus, once it gets onto a surface, it is there, it is infectious for quite a long time. SARS, influenza, they are not like that. They have um, a coat that they wear that's absolutely crucial for infection. And that coat is very susceptible to disinfectants, to soap. And if you break that viral coat down, even with soap and water, then you have inactivated the virus. So I think that's really important. And even with soap, 20 second contact time, even on a surface, is it sufficient to destroy that virus so it's no longer going to infect you? So while hard surfaces might be, if you're in an area where somebody, as Dr. Wolf said, is exhaling a lot of viral particles, it is possible that you could touch a surface, grab their cell phone, work on their computer, whatever, and then touch your face put your fingers in your mouth, put your fingers in your nose. This is where kids and schools, you know, you have to make sure they're washing their hands, rub your eyes. All of those are ways that you can infect yourself from a hard surface. So this is why we also tell you, don't play with your face. And if you watch, most people do play with their faces. So this has been a very hard and very steep learning curve for most of us. And if I was wearing a mask right now, I would be playing with it, I promise you. Yeah, if most people touch their face at least 24 times a day or something. So in any event, let's move on to a subject everybody's focused on, which is testing. So, Gloria. Thank you, Arnold. And, and thank you, everyone. This has been very interesting. And Dr. Morris, let me ask you as um, our expert in terms of testing, and everyone can jump in as well. I would like to ask you a couple of questions in one, if I may. The first one is, could you start to tell us what are the different tests available um, today for COVID? Also, what is the, the role of temperature check uh, to detect the illness? And uh, aligned with that, there are a lot of uh, um, noise in terms of the false positives and the false negatives. Could you also talk about that, please, if you don't mind? Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Gloria Arnold, it's it's a, a really a, a, a privilege, privilege, excuse me, to be here with these panelists today uh, and to have the opportunity to share what we know uh, with the, with the people who are interested in learning. Uh, it's uh, with COVID nineteen, there has been a focus on laboratory diagnostics and clinical laboratory, which is at least in my career, nothing like it because essentially everyone across the globe now is very very invested in how can we detect this virus and how can we diagnose patients with COVID-19? Uh, we have really two types of tests available. One uh, are the tests that detect the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself, the virus that causes COVID-19 disease. Uh, we've heard the most about PCR testing, which is to test for the nucleic acids, uh, typically done in a large centralized laboratory like we have at Mayo Clinic here and, and Cleveland Clinic and across, really across the globe. The other is a blood test uh, to look for, uh, have you been infected by the virus and generated an immune response? Uh, that's the serologic testing or the blood testing where we look for antibodies that are generated. These are proteins that are specific for the SARS-CoV-2 virus that an individual creates after they've been infected. Um, typically about a week or so after they've been infected, you'll start to see these antibodies appear. What the challenge really is, is that if you look at the first set of tests, the test, do I have the virus? Um, which also includes other tests now, an antigen tests, where we test for the proteins of the virus as opposed to the nucleic acids. There's no single test that you can take or give to an individual and say, well, if it comes back negative, I can say with absolute certainty that you don't have SARS-CoV-2. Um, then that's not really dependent just on the test, but as Dr. Gordon was describing, patients are infective before they have symptoms. And we know that at that time, there's a window of time when the test, or when the virus is just difficult to detect because it's growing in their system and it's just more difficult to detect because they don't have a lot of it. Um, so that's on the one side. On the other side is that 
for the body, for the antibody test, excuse me, you're testing for the body's response to the virus. And so it's automatically going to be a little bit more challenging. Some of the early tests, while they were very sensitive, meaning that it, the chance that if a positive test detected the virus was high, they also had some problems with specificity, meaning false positive. We were detecting antibodies to other um, coronaviruses, potentially. Those tests have improved over time. I, I think that the bottom line in terms of reliability of the testing now for both the virus itself and for the, um, and for the antibodies, they're both over 99% um, sensitive, or at least uh, for the antibodies, 99% sensitive and specific. For the molecular and the, um, and the antigen tests, those are a little bit of a different story. So the most sensitive is to take the nasal pharyngeal swab, which is a swab that has to go all the way in the back of your nose, um, and do the molecular PCR test. If we do that and the patient has an adequate viral load, the sensitivity is very high, over 90%, over 95%. However, um, if you do it early or if you do other specimens, which might be more convenient, we've heard a lot about saliva testing, um, we've heard about other you know, nasal, nasal swabs, those are certainly easier to collect, but as you make the specimens easier to collect, unfortunately, the chance that you'll miss the virus when it's present, not because of the test, but because of the way you collect the specimen goes up. So that's really the balance that we're trying to strike here. Um, in terms of protecting people uh, and, and stopping the spread, we're really focused on that pre-symptomatic transmission because that is the, such a part of this viral life cycle. Um, and the, of course, the conundrum is that it's also the time it's most difficult to detect. That's why we've seen things like temperature check, other biometric responses to the virus that can help uh, us determine if someone is potentially ill. It doesn't replace the, the diagnostic test for the virus, but it does help in that pre-symptomatic window. If someone has a temperature um, it's, you know, and they have potential exposure, the likelihood that they're uh, going to be positive goes up. And therefore, you might either want to use a more sensitive test or even consider repeat testing in individuals like that just because we know the tests need, might not be um, positive the first time, but as they get more of the virus, they'll be easier to detect. So, so those are some of the, the, the challenges uh, that we have with the testing right now. Um, you know, and, and I think the big thing with this is that uh, we talk a lot about the tests we have today. Just as, as Dr. Gordon mentioned in this pre-protective phase, a lot of focus on vaccines and treatments. We'll also see a very intense focus on lab tests as well, uh, making the test to detect the virus better. Um, also, the challenge that we have, uh, you know, is that we can detect the virus, but we don't always know that that translates to, can I infect someone because the virus is detected? So we'll be doing tests to, and developing tests that will predict hopefully whether or not just you can detect the virus, but whether someone can actually infect someone else, because that's clearly someone that needs to be isolated. And then the big question is, why do some people get sick and, and more sick than others? And even if someone has the antibody, we can say you've been exposed to the virus and have generated an immune response, but we don't have a test yet to say that you are immune, you are safe from the virus. And so that's really going to be the focus of testing going forward is getting better at detecting the virus, getting better at saying if you can actually infect someone with the virus. And more importantly, is are you immune to the virus, either because of prior exposure or because of immunization? Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Let me ask you a follow-up question. So based on what you're saying is that would it help to have multiple tests? So to have a test and then based on what you say and Dr. Gordon say five days later to perform another test, would that help to reduce, I mean, the, the possibility of having the virus or is it just um, redundant? What's your opinion? <laughs> It depends. Uh, it's, I mean, that's not the best answer. It depends. Well, it really is uh, very much predicated on how vigilant you're trying to be in detecting the virus. Um, you could argue that detect it, that if someone comes in, we know that the very early time after exposure is when you're most likely to be negative. You could do a test. Um, you could wait and see if that person develops symptoms. And if they don't, uh, retest. And then if the repeat is negative after a few days, then you can be very highly confident that, they're, that they don't have the virus. Um, that's probably the safest ways uh, to do that. And we've seen that in settings where they're trying to create a truly protective environment, like uh, the professional bubbles for professional sports, the NHL, others. But honestly, with screening, with a good clinical history, and with testing, if you do all those together, and as I look to, the, to my clinical colleagues here, you can have a pretty great high degree of certainty that someone doesn't have the virus if you take a good clinical history, exposure history, and the other piece of this is also understanding where people live. So if they're coming from an area 
where the virus is, is rampantly spreading, you might have to be more vigilant that they might be uh, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic with the virus versus uh, parts of the globe where the virus has been well controlled. You probably need to be less vigilant because the probability that they have the virus and are asymptomatic is much lower. And I, I think that is, a, that is that is interesting. That is the ahead, crucial please. point that uh, uh, that that has made this virus so successful. Um, the there are two elements that that coming together ha has caused the pandemic, and the first is that um, the time from acquiring the infection to being contagious is very short. It's about two days. So if I get infected right by someone on Sunday, I can start spreading it on Tuesday. And then the second is that for the two or three days before you develop symptoms, you're infectious. And in fact, peak infectiousness is just before or just after you get symptoms. And so what that means is by the time I get symptoms, not only have I spread it to someone else, they've started spreading it to other people. And so even if you track down everyone I was in contact with, you can't necessarily have stopped that, that second level of transmission. That secondary transmission is essential for the success of a, a virus that wants to cause a pandemic. And um, as Dr. Gordon said at the beginning, you know, Michael Crichton would have written this virus, although, you know, he, he might have written in some unusual symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, I could, if I could weigh in, because I want to have some level of uh, optimism here. So as pointed out, um, you know, testing is not should not be the tail that wags a dog. You don't want to test, you know, as as I think my colleague from Mayo will say to the clinicians is when you order a test, know what you're going to do with the results. Uh, and I think that becomes extremely important. And as you can see, we're moving away from from what I call test based strategies, which I think is important in terms of recovery and also in terms of isolation. But as I move forward, because one thing we haven't talked about yet is um, obviously this isn't the only respiratory virus we deal with. And before we know it, it's going to be a uh, respiratory season. So how can we turn this into a positive in, in my mind? And you talk about testing complexity because obviously I'm not a good enough clinician to know if someone comes to me uh, with fever and sore throat or and is it COVID, is it Corona, is it RSV or is it flu? I'm not that good. It won't be. But But the consequences can be. So I think the important things as we're looking forward, what we're changing our philosophies now in the hospital, where we now have a lot of patients coming in, in vulnerable, we've moved to what we call universal pandemic precautions. And essentially, uh, I'm old enough to remember HIV. It means that every single patient now we assume, symptoms or not, is potentially harboring a respiratory virus. And that's informing what we call our PPE, meaning, uh, as was mentioned by my colleague before, in, when I face a patient now, it's a mask, but it's also a face shield, so I don't contaminate that. That's in the hospital. That's high-risk transmission settings. But I, I apply the same philosophy in public. So, Gloria, if I see you in London, um, I, symptoms or not, I'm just going to assume you might be harboring also. And so I will try to maintain my distance, but I will mask, and hopefully you'll mask too. And so these are the things I say, you know, serenity prayer, things we can control <laughs> until we move forward. And this is the universal, uh, you know, which we have for bloodborne pathogens. This is a change for us. But as, as was mentioned, until we get into the protective phase. Now, hopefully this will reduce, as we've seen in Australia, decreased amount of influenza morbidity and mortality amongst our kids. I know my pediatricians are all into that and other things. And if you look at countries that have masked for flu season before COVID, they've always had lower rates of, of influenza and respiratory viruses. So similar to when I go to the airport, now I get screened. In the future for respiratory season, even post COVID, we might be all wearing masks and, and shields during that time period. Uh, and my only last thing for public health is don't forget to get your jab. I mean, uh, yeah. the, the flu shot is extremely important. Yeah, yeah can, I, can I make a comment on that since that is, that is what we, that's the specialty at St. Jude is influenza. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's fascinating that we're watching the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, where they've done a nice job containing COVID. And we're not seeing much flu activity, even though it's clearly flu season. And we don't know, is it because of the social distancing, the hand hygiene, the mask? Is it that the virus has just taken over 
we don't know, but it is very good news. And we'll keep our fingers crossed. It will be similar when we hit our flu season, but absolutely get your shot as well. I and I would just add to you, there, is, is, um, there, is talk, there is talk about additional testing or new tests. And um, the question I have is, do we need new testing or is the testing regimens that we have, you feel adequate for society to manage this as best as it can? And if we do need new testing, which tests seem to be closest to coming through? Um, obviously, everyone wants a rapid test that's low cost. Uh, Israel has tests using sound waves or breathalyzers um, based on terahertz waves, isothermic identification, all these different types of testing protocols. So, uh, Dr. Maurice, first, um, you know, what do you see is the next phase in testing? It, should there be a next phase? And if it is, what would it be and how soon? Well, I think that, you know, one of the points I was going to make is that uh, because this pre-symptomatic transmission is such a part of this virus, it's put a huge strain on the testing infrastructure globally because um, you can't wait for someone who's sick and then test for the virus because then you've missed the infective window, as the panelists have really nicely pointed out. So that means that there's been a lot of innovation happening to try and bolster our ability to detect people with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And in the U.S. and in, in, in Western Europe, there's been a talk of pooling, meaning that we take multiple specimens and put them into a single tube to analyze so we can screen more individuals uh, in, in a run, in a test. Um, that works well if the prevalence is low. If the prevalence gets above 10 percent, so in areas of the country where we're seeing surges, for instance, that really doesn't work that well. The other piece, and that's why we're hearing a lot about antigen testing, and I think particularly when you start to look at low and middle income countries where they have a less developed healthcare infrastructure, uh, antigen testing, uh, things that can be done at the point of care, which are accurate, um, it become really important for helping to control the spread. And I think one of the things we've learned is that if we don't control this virus in one part of the globe, we don't control this virus for the globe. So I think we all have to be invested in global health and addressing healthcare disparities, not just in the US, but globally. Um, I think what we'll see to your question is an evolving really a system of diagnostics where we have wide deployment of less sensitive tests like antigen tests and saliva tests that can be used to help screen and identify where we might see the virus emerging. And then we can fo focus the big guns, if you will, the in-lab molecular tests that have the high sensitivity to really understand the, then where the virus is in those communities and do containment measures. Got it. Thank you. That's, that's interesting. Doctor, I was going to ask you, and you mentioned the, the pool testing, yes, because in, in Asia they are talking about that, and a lot of reports have been written about testing people with one simple and having 10, and if you get a positive, then you go back and test all of those. And, and you, I think you answer, say, when there are low levels, that's efficient, but when you have high levels, it's, it's not the case. Is that what I understood correct? That's exactly right. I mean, it's been common actually in like blood banking for years, you know, where we know we're, we're screening for low prevalence diseases just to make sure the blood is safe. So if it's low prevalence, you can get a lot more efficient use of the laboratory and get a lot more specimens through. But of course, if you have a pool that's positive, then you have to go back and test every individual that was put together into that pool. So if it's prevalence is high, you end up doing more work by going back and figuring out who in a group, which, which member of a group was positive. So that's where you have to strike the right balance. That's good. Last question, I couldn't resist. There's an article about dogs um, that have been trained to detect COVID. Uh, is that better than temperature check? What's your opinion? I mean, I'm sure that you have seen that in this part of the world that they are talking about training dogs and having them at the airports and border crossing and all of that. Can you comment on that? I'm happy to weigh in. Uh, you know, dogs have one thing that we have not been able to do with artificial intelligence is a sense of smell. And if you look at the dog's olfactory, it's unique. And the dogs we see in the airport are looking for vegetables or they're trained for other things. I will say, though, there are animals that do get COVID. The ferret, as we know, in influenza is also susceptible to COVID. Um, but we also use dogs or smell. Even in the nurses will tell you they can smell a patient with C. diff. So I, I wouldn't dismiss that. Um, but I'm not certain that's going to be our frictionless way forward, Gloria, in terms of, uh, <laughs> of moving forward. But, but, I, but I wouldn't dismiss it uh, yeah, altogether. That's good. Thank you. I know there are some dogs that, that test for malaria. You know, um, the, the dogs can sniff malaria as well. So we'll, we'll see what happens with all that. But I, I, I want to thank you all 
um, very much for the panel. It's been um, in informative. Um, uh, some of the things that are out there, you know, obviously there's um, information that leans one way or the other, but clearly it's a continuous learning process. And I can't thank you all enough for your time. Everyone, we're going to take a pause here for about 10 minutes, and we'll start with the second panel. But to our panelists, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for sharing thank your you. experience. Thank you.